Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. This video is part three of our seventh flight lesson in the instrument training series focusing on flying a localizer approach. In this video we'll conduct a demonstration flight demonstrating how to fly a localizer approach in the Cessna 172 Classic analog or steam gauge panel. In video one of this lesson series we talked about what a localizer approach is and the basic theory of how to fly one. If you haven't already, you'll want to watch that video before you watch this one. You can find it here, and I'll also leave a link to that video in this video's description. In the second video, we demonstrated flying a localizer approach using the G1000 equipped Cessna 172. If you want to check out that video, it's available here, and I'll leave a link to that video in this video's description as well. You'll also want to be familiar with the basics of using VORs and distance measuring equipment or DME before trying to fly a localizer approach. You also need to be familiar with the techniques you can use to descend on an approach without vertical guidance. This is covered in part one of this lesson series and I also do a more in-depth discussion of the topic in a separate video. The Cessna 172 Classic is also equipped with a Garmin GNS 530 and 430. We won't be loading the approaches in these units or using any of their advanced features, but we will be using the basic GPS functions plus the nav radios and DME readout. So it's a good idea to have a basic familiarity with these units before attempting to fly this approach. Links to videos on all these topics plus a link to the entire instrument training series are available in this video's description. I'll also mention that parts of this video will be duplicated from the video on flying this approach in the G1000 equipped 172, so I'll try to mark those spots so you can skip ahead if you've already seen that video. It's also worth mentioning that the 172 Classic aircraft is only available in the Deluxe Edition of Microsoft Flight Simulator, so you won't be able to fly the approach with this aircraft unless you have the Deluxe or Premium Deluxe Edition of the sim. To demonstrate flying a localizer approach, we'll conduct a short IFR flight between Rogers Executive Airport in Rogers, Arkansas, which incidentally is home to the Walmart Air Force. Identifier on that airport is Kilo Romeo Oscar Golf, to Drake Field in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Identifier on that field is Kilo Foxtrot Yankee Victor. We'll plan to fly the localizer approach to runway 16 at Drake Field. After departing Rogers, we'll proceed direct to the Razorback VOR, which is an initial approach fix for the localizer approach at Drake Field. We'll track the 221 degree radial from Razorback VOR 6.2 miles to intercept the localizer for runway 16 at Drake Field and then track that in for the approach. Our filed route will be Rogers Airport, direct Razorback VOR, direct Fayetteville. We'll file for an altitude of 3,000 feet. While this is lower than both the Aroca on the in-route chart and the MSA on the approach chart, it is the top altitude specified in the Rogers departure off of Rogers, as we'll see in a minute. And a quick check of the VFR chart shows it to be at least 1,000 feet above all obstacles between Rogers and Razorback VOR. So it's likely at or above ATC's minimum vectoring altitude as well. Though in real life, it would be worth having a conversation with ATC to make sure it's a safe altitude to file and fly for this route. The entire flight is 24 track miles and it only takes around 15 minutes to fly in the 172, so things will happen rather quickly. We'll plan to depart runway 20 at Rogers. We've checked the takeoff and departure procedures for Rogers and there are no obstacle DPs, but there is a standard instrument departure or SID called the Rogers 4 departure that we'll utilize. It's a simple vector departure that has you turn to a heading of 183 after takeoff from runway 20, which will put us on a heading towards Razorback VOR. As we mentioned earlier, it has a top altitude of 3000 feet. We'll assume that the weather at Rogers is good enough that we can get back in on the ILS they have to runway 20 and that we feel comfortable departing. The weather at Drake Field is reported as calm winds, one mile visibility in mist, ceiling of 600 overcast with a temperature and dew point of 15 degrees C, and altimeter of 2992. We'll assume that we filed an alternate for the flight and that it is a legal alternate. 
So let's take a dive into the chart to make sure that we're aware of everything that we need to be aware of for shooting this approach. We'll go top left to bottom right like we usually do. Uh, again, we identify the field. Fayetteville, Arkansas is the city. It is Drake Field, identifier KFYV, and it is the localizer for runway 16. Top left tells us the primary nav aid for the approach. It tells, it that it tells us that it is a localizer with DME. The identifier is IFYV, and the frequency for that is 111.9. tells us that it has a, D a TACAN channel, which tells us that it has DME. We can't do anything as a civilian with the channel information there. Uh, tells us that the approach course is 167, and that is reiterated here on the plan view. Then it gives us runway information. Uh, tells us that the uh, landing length for the runway that we're going to, to runway 16, is 6,005 feet. So we have 6,005 feet to get the aircraft down and stopped on this runway. Tells us that the touchdown zone elevation for runway 16 is 1252. So that's when what we will see uh, on our altimeter when we touch down on that runway. Actually, it's the highest point, the first 3,000 feet of the runway. And you can see that the airport elevation is also 1252. Uh, down here, we have our uh, T that tells us if it has special departure procedures or non-standard takeoff minimums or obstacle departure notes. Uh, none of that is really a factor for us as an arrival, uh, but if we decide to depart out of there, that is a factor. And it tells it has non-standard alternate minimums if we want to file this airport as an alternate. And again, that doesn't apply to us uh, as an arrival, just as if we wanted to file it as an alternate. Taking a look at the notes here, it tells us uh, some things about circling and about uh, helicopter minimums. None of those apply to us since we are neither circling nor a helicopter. Uh, but it does have a note here that DME is required for this approach, uh, so that is applicable to us, and our aircraft is equipped with DME. Over to the right here, it shows us what type of approach lighting system it has. It has a system called ODALS, or Omnidirectional Approach Lighting System. Uh, what this is, is basically the sequence flashing lights that you see on other bigger types of approach systems, but the difference is that you can see these lights um, from any direction. Uh, no matter where you are in relation to those lights, you'll be able to see them uh, versus the uh, typical sequence flashing lights you have on other approach lights. You can only see them if you're on the approach for that runway. Uh, the lights are actually painted over uh, in the direction, other direction, so you can't see them, hence the term omnidirectional approach lighting system. You can see them from any direction. Over to the right, it tells us our missed approach procedure. If we arrived at our missed approach point or our DDA, uh, and we need to go miss. This is what we do. We climb to 2,100 feet straight ahead. Then we make a right turn while climbing to 4,000, and we take up a heading of 295. We go out and we intercept the Razorback uh, VOR's 221 degree radial, same one that we took uh, that we're going to take down to intercept the localizer, and we'll track that to uh, Sumo intersection, which is at 22.1 DME, and then we hold from there. And you can see that's depicted down here on the plan view, climbing straight ahead. Once you reach uh, 2100, then you make that right turn to go up here and intercept the 221 radial, and you track it out to sumo and enter the holding pattern. Below that, it has all of our uh, radio frequencies that we will use uh, for the approach. Uh, and then on the plan view, we have our minimum uh, sector altitude here, or minimum safe altitude off of Razorback VOR. Uh, notice that this is Razorback VR, so it is all uh, pegged off of this point right here, uh, not the runway. So, uh, you know, you're, uh, looks like about, what, probably 10 or 12 miles south of Razorback VR when, we, when you are at uh, the field. So bear that in mind. Uh, and it's divided up into four sectors, with one of those sectors being quite high. This isn't really applicable to us today, again, because we're using that top altitude from the departure uh, that takes us to 3,000, and then we'll very quickly be at Razorback VOR, where we can start to use those procedure altitudes. So looking at the plan view a little more, we have uh, some water that's depicted up here. I believe this is Beaver Lake in northwest Arkansas there. Uh, it tells us the, again, Razorback approach is an initial approach. That's the one that we're going to use. Tells you the name. Frequency is 16.4. Identifier is RZC. It has the Morse code, and then it has the channel there. And we'll go talk about that here in just a second. The other ways you can get on the approach, you can navigate to Sumo and take this uh, feeder route up there. Notice it doesn't say no PT. So if you do that, you are going to have to uh, do this um, 
procedure turn, this uh, holding pattern type procedure turn. You could also navigate, you'll notice LME is listed as both an intermediate fix and an initial approach fix. So you can navigate direct to LME. And if you're doing this as an initial approach fix, you would again need to do that uh, procedure turn. So looking at the route that we are going to take, we're going to navigate to Razorback VOR. And so we're going to take, and again, it's initial approach fix. And then we'll take the 221 degree radial 6.2 miles down to Elmi intersection. And you'll notice it says the uh, procedure altitude on this portion of the approach is 3,000 feet. So once we hit that, if we were above that, we could descend to 3,000 if we're cleared for the approach. It does say no PT, so we don't have to worry about doing uh, this procedure turn here. We just navigate straight on to the localizer and fly on in. It does have a note here that uh, the procedure is not available for arrivals from Razorback Vortac Airways uh, between 150 and 264. Basically, that would be coming down from the south over here, uh, which makes sense. It would be a pretty hard turn to get on that uh, route to Elmi if you were coming in from the south. Uh, Elmi intersection is uh, where we will navigate to. We can identify that with the intersection of that 221 degree radial and the localizer, or we can identify it with 6.2 DME from Razorback VOR, or we can identify it with 11 DME from the localizer IFYV. Again, the localizer gives the information down here. It is 111.9 for the frequency. It gives us the identifier in both uh, text and Morse code. It gives us that channel number, and then the uh, course is going to be 167. Uh, so we will navigate down from Razorback VOR to Elmi intersection. That's where we'll intercept the localizer. Let's take a look at, uh, well, it's mentioned but some other things about the plan view before we move down to the uh, profile view. We mentioned Elmi intersection here at 11 DME. It also has hog intersection, which is our final approach fix, which we'll look at in just a second. That's identified with 5 DME. It also has Zabco intersection, a step down fix, which is 3.7 DME. And we'll look at all this on the profile view in here just a second. You can see it's got multiple obstacles around here uh, between 15 and 1800 feet, a size 2000 feet up around the airport and then the tallest obstacle down here is in the right hand corner at 2352 so definitely a factor on your missed approach something you want to make sure that you start that turn fairly quickly once you get uh, on the mist if you have to go missed approach so looking at our profile view here, uh, it tells us about the holding pattern for the holding pattern procedure turn. None of that applies to us. We're not going to do that, but it does have that 3,000 foot altitude prior to getting to Elmi. Once you hit Elmi, again, 11 DME from the Fayetteville or from the uh, localizer runway 16, you can go ahead and if you're cleared for the approach, descend down to 2,500 feet. Hog is our final approach fix, which is identified with 5 DME from the uh, localizer transmitter. It's got the Maltese cross there. So once we hit that, we can start our descent towards our MDA. Uh, it gives us our three degree visual descent angle, which we talked about on our uh, descending on a non-precision approach video and uh, our threshold crossing height of 50 feet. It does have this step down fix at Zabco, which is 3.7 DME from uh, the localizer transmitter and we need to be at or above 2080 when we cross that fix. It does have a visual descent point at 2.7 nautical miles. This means that if we don't have the airport in sight by this point, we could uh, theoretically level off at our MDA or our DDA and then fly forward to our missed approach fix. Uh, but we need to be aware that we may be too high to make it down to the runway at that point. And then our missed approach fix for this uh, approach is 1.2 DME, which is at the runway threshold. And again, it's 1.2 DME because the, lo the uh, localizer transmitter and the DME transmitter is at this end of the runway. We're arriving at this end of the runway. It's a 6,000 foot, foot runway. So it's 1.2 DME away, DME away from the transmitter to the end of the threshold there for runway 16. So looking at our minimums down here, we do want to do the straight in to localizer, straight in localizer to runway 16. Uh, the MDA for, we are category A aircraft, so our MDA is going to be 1,780 feet on the altimeter. Uh, that equals 528 feet above the ground. Uh, we're going to calculate a DDA that's going to be, we add 50 feet to get our derived decision altitude or uh, DDA. That's going to be 1830 feet and that's going to be 578 feet above the ground. So with a 600 foot ceiling, we should still be able to get in. 
you'll notice it uh, lists the distance between each uh, point here on the approach on the profile view in addition to having the DME there. And then looking at our airport a diagram tells us that the elevation uh, for the field is 1252. I think this should be actually touchdown zone elevation here. Uh, I, I think this is a typo uh, for why they didn't put TDZE here instead of elevation. But it gives you the elevation twice, which is the same as the touchdown zone elevation. Shows you where the approach is coming in from. It's, it's uh, very much a straight-in approach. Lines you right up with the runway, as a localizer should. Shows you the old dial type approach lighting system. It shows you the PAPI. They do have a PAPI on the left-hand side of the runway here. Uh, they have the control tower over here and the beacon over here it tells you how high those are. Then it gives us the information for uh, the runway. So it's 6,005 feet long by 100 feet wide. Uh, so a nice long runway for our Cessna 172. And again, to rehash how we're going to fly this procedure, we're going to take off from Rogers. We'll fly to the Razorback Vortac. We'll cross over the Vortac, and then we'll turn, intercept, and track the 221-degree radial down towards Elmi intersection. It's 6.2 nautical miles to get from the VOR or the Vortac down to Elmi intersection and intercept the localizer. It tells us on the approach that the procedure altitude is 3,000 feet. That's where we'll already be. But if we were at a higher altitude, once we got cleared for the approach, once we hit the VOR and start tracking on that radial, we can go ahead and descend down to 3,000 feet. It also says no PT, so we know we don't have to do this little holding pattern here uh, prior to proceeding inbound of the, uh, the approach. We can just hit Elmi intersection, intercept the localizer, and start to track inbound. Looking at the profile view, once we hit Elmi and start tracking inbound on the localizer, we can go ahead and des descend down to 2,500 feet. And once we level at 2,500 feet, uh, then we'll go ahead and start to configure for the approach. We will be using the con constant descent uh, final approach technique or the CDFA technique. Uh, and with that, we're going to use a derived decision altitude or DDA of 1830 that we're going to treat just like a decision altitude. In other words, we're going to gradually descend to that altitude rather than dropping down to the MDA and then flying forward. And once we re reach that decision altitude, if we don't see anything, then we'll go ahead and execute the missed approach. We got that DDA by adding 50 feet to our MDA. Again, category A MDA for this approach is 1780. Add 50 feet, you come up with eight, uh, 1830 on the DDA. And the target descent rate that we'll use to stay on this uh, three degree uh, glide path or the three degree uh, visual descent angle will be about 400 feet per minute. And uh, our descent cross checkpoints will be at 4.2 DME, 3.2 DME, and then 2.2 DME, although this is beyond where we'd be at the DDA. So we should have the runway at sight, in sight at this point. Uh, and again, this is, uh, three miles from the runway, two miles from the runway, and one mile from the runway. And these are the altitudes we should be at at those points. And that will help us determine whether we are low or high or right on the glide path. And if none of that is making any sense to you, uh, then I do recommend going back and looking at the in-depth localizer approach tutorial, part one of this uh, series. And that will explain about this a little bit. If you want to do a deep dive into what we're talking about here, make sure and take a look at the video on uh, instrument descents without vertical guidance. Basically, the techniques you can use to descend on an approach like this that doesn't have vertical guidance. And I'll leave links to both of those videos in this video's uh, description. So to look at how we will specifically fly this approach in the 172, uh, when we get to 2,500 feet, again, we'll start to configure the approach. That should be about three miles from HOG, which is our final approach fix. HOG is at five DME, so three miles prior to that would be eight DME on the 16 localizer transmitter. That's where we'll start to configure, and we'll do that by bringing the power to 1,800 RPM. Uh, if we're below 110 knots, which we should be, bring the flaps out to 10. Allow the aircraft to slow at 85 knots, bring those flaps out to 30 incrementally, one notch at a time. And then once you get to about 70 knots, uh, then bring the power up to maintain 70 knots. 70 knots. Uh, and that you want to leave that a little bit. So around 75 knots or so is probably when you bring, want to bring that power back in. Should be about 2200 to 2400 RPM uh, to stay level at 2500 feet uh, at that 70 knots in landing configuration. 
So once we reach our final approach fix of hog intersection, which again we identify with 5.0 DME from that localizer transmitter, we'll go want to go ahead and start our descent. So we will initiate a 400 foot per minute descent to uh, start that targeted descent uh, to stay on that visual descent angle. And then we'll want to reduce power about 1800 to 2000 RPMs should uh, keep you at 70 knots as you're descending at 400 feet per minute. Then you want to keep take a look at your descent cross checkpoints and cross check your altitude with those cross checkpoints, and then move that descent rate up or down as you need uh, to make sure that you are on that path. Uh, you want to track the localizer with small changes in heading, just like you would with a ILS localizer. And then you're going to descend to the DDA, take a look up, and if you have the visual uh, cues. Uh, required, then you're going to go ahead and trans transition to a visual landing. Or if you reach the DDA, uh, go ahead and you don't see anything, then go ahead and execute the missed approach. One thing I want to mention about doing a missed approach off, an, off of an approach without vertical guidance is unlike a precision approach or an approach with vertical guidance, where you can do everything that's listed on the missed approach pretty much immediately and regardless of where you execute the missed approach with a an approach without vertical guidance, you can start the missed approach climb anytime you need to, uh, anytime you decide to execute the missed approach, but you need to to hold off on making any lateral move maneuvers, any turns, until you actually reach the missed approach point because the missed approach is based on you starting your turning maneuvers once you hit uh, that missed approach point. For, so for example, for coming down uh, on this approach, we get to our DDA of 1830, uh, but we're still say 2.7 nautical miles from the end of the runway. We'll go ahead and start our climb. And again, the missed approach says climb to 2100. We get to 2100, but we're still say at 2.0 DME or 1.8 DME. We don't want to start that turn until we actually get to 1.2 DME. So regardless of when you get to 2100 feet, wait until you get to that 1.2 DME to begin your turning maneuver. Just like with an ILS approach, we can descend below our DDA or our MDA if we have the approach lights in sight, but not the runway. Uh, but we can go lo no lower than 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation until the runway is in sight. And that is going to look a little different than it does on an ILS approach. Uh, so looking at our approach here, our touchdown zone elevation is 1252. Add 100 to that. We can go down as low as 1352 uh, on our altimeter if we have just the approach lights in sight. And hopefully if we descend that low, we can go ahead and get the runway in sight and continue, continue to a visual landing. But the difference between an ILS is if we're at a DDA of 1830, we're almost 600 feet off the ground versus, versus with an ILS, we are only 200 feet on the ground, off the ground. So we're only descending another 100 feet on an ILS, whereas here we're descending almost 500 feet. Uh, so we've got quite a bit further that we can go down uh, on a, an approach like this that does not have vertical guidance. And our automation options in the Cessna 172 Classic on this approach and really on all approaches are is uh, pretty straightforward. You can use the autopilot or you can hand fly the approach. Uh, I will be demonstrating this approach in this video with the autopilot. So we'll show you how to use the autopilot. Uh, but either method is a valid method to use. Uh, it's not like you have a flight director mode that you have to contemplate using in the 172 Classic. It's either autopilot on or autopilot off. All right, so let's go ahead and hop into the sim and set up the, for the uh, approach, set up for this flight. Uh, so we're working from the world map. We'll work top left uh, over to the right, just like we usually do to set up our flights. For, so first, we'll look at the aircraft selection. Uh, we want the Textron Aviation Cessna 172 Skyhawk. You probably won't see a rest of blue unless you have this particular livery in, uh, installed. Uh, but the, uh, the main thing you want to pay attention to here is that you don't want the Cessna 172 Skyhawk G1000. And again, if you don't have the Deluxe Edition or the Premium Deluxe Edition, you will not have this aircraft. You won't be able to fly this approach with this aircraft. Liveries, you can do anything you want there. Weight and balance, I do recommend go ahead and topping off the tanks. So two full main tanks. And then I stick with the two 170 pound occupants in the front two seats. That's pretty realistic for an IFR training flight. You don't want any failures and then customization. You can set the end number however you would like to. 
Uh, as far as departure, we will select Rogers. So we'll go here and put in Kilo Romeo Oscar Golf is the identifier there. It sets us up on runway 20, and that's perfectly acceptable. If you'd like to start on the runway, you can do that. Or you can start on the ramp and taxi out, uh, whichever you prefer for the training flight. It's not that important. I'll we'll probably start on the ramp and taxi out uh, to make it realistic. Uh, but if you wanted to start on the runway, that's okay. Uh, flight conditions, I'm going to select a mid-June day, and that's mostly for lighting. Uh, we will set up the weather once we get into the actual sim session itself. Then I'll go out here and I'll go to the bottom left, and I will set the time at uh, noon. And again, that is basically for lighting conditions. Uh, so all that is set up, and uh, we are ready to go ahead and jump in the aircraft and start the flight. So as far as setting the weather up for this approach, uh, you want to make sure that your altitude collection calculation is at uh, AMSL above mean sea level. I did not stick any precipitation in here just because it might lower the visibility down lower and I've got the clouds set to where we should have about a mile of visibility. No snow depth, no lightning unless you're wanting to fly with that. Uh, temperature set at about uh, 65 degrees Celsius at, or excuse me 65 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be a little warm. Uh, 65 degrees Fahrenheit at uh, sea level, and that'll give you about 15 degrees C uh, at the elevation uh, in Fayetteville and Rogers, which is, again, around 12, 1,300 feet. Standard pressure, just so we don't have to mess with that. Humidity, whatever you would like there. If you raise humidity, just to be aware, it's going to drop the visibility a little bit. So I do have it set for a humidity of 1. As far as the cloud settings go, uh, we do have uh, the lowest layer set to 100% overcast. Uh, we have the density set at 0.5, and that should give you uh, about a mile visibility again. Uh, no scatter, you just a 0% on the scatter. Uh, and then I put the tops up around 11,000 feet. You can put them where you'd like. And then I put the bottoms 1,000 feet under the MDA for the approach. The MDA is 1780, so I put it at 780. And again, this should give us a breaking out about 600 feet. Uh, right about that DDA with about a mile visibility so that we'll get those approach lights in sight. I did save this as a weather preset, so it's real quick to load. All you have to do is click the double folder there uh, to do that, and I just labeled it localizer 16KFYV. All right, so we're in the aircraft at Rogers on the ramp. Uh, we've started the engine, and we'll go ahead and go through and uh, set up the aircraft uh, for the flight here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my heading bug for the runway heading here at Rogers. It's 197, so I'll set the bug there. Uh, we do have that Rogers for departure. We'll do that heading for 400 feet, and then we'll turn left to a heading of 183. Uh, and then start to track towards Razorback from there. So that is set up for that. And uh, the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and set up my nav radios. So the first thing I want to do is you'll notice they're all displaying GPS right now, and I want them to display uh, VOR information and not GPS information. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hit that CDI button, and you'll see that turns them all to VLOC instead of GPS. So now we are receiving uh, VOR information instead of GPS course information. I'll go ahead and scoot my camera over here a little closer uh, so you can see the radios here a little bit better. You could also do that for number one nav with this button right up here. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is set up the radios themselves. So I'll go ahead and hit the, the uh, CV button here and go to the standby frequency for VOR number one. I'm going to put Razorback VOR in there. Uh, frequency is 16.4, and I will go ahead and swap that out and put that in the active frequency. And you can see we're already receiving. We're going to front flag. We're getting a good ID. We're getting a radial, and we're getting a distance uh, from that VOR. Uh, so we're actually receiving that on the ground, at least in flight simulator. I'm also going to set up my OBS here. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in a heading or a course of 183. Uh, which is the course I want to fly after I get to 400 feet on that Rogers for departure. Uh, but as you can see here, it's also going to be pretty close uh, to direct to the VOR. So that's a pretty good uh, course to have in there to go direct to the VOR once I get airborne. With the bottom uh, transmitter there, or the bottom uh, standby frequency on this, I'm going to go ahead and put in the localizer frequency for Fayetteville's Drake Field. So that'll be 111.9. Uh, so I'll put that in there, and that'll be standing by for uh, when I want to switch over to start to track the localizer, intercept and track the localizer. Uh, for the number two VOR, I'm going to go ahead and put in Razorback VOR uh, or Vortac in the active frequency here. 
And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put in the course that I want to track outbound from the VOR, which is uh, 221. Uh, all right, so there is 221 loaded up in there. And then that gives me some course information off of the Razorback once we pass over the VOR as to uh, where we need to turn to intercept and track that 221 degree radial. And then what I'm going to do is as I get closer uh, to intercepting the localizer, I'm going to flip uh, this over to the localizer and keep this in the VOR so that I've got good uh, course information on both uh, of those nav aids as I track that radial and go to intercept the VOR. So this will become my primary for tracking the VOR while I look at this to look at the localizer intercept. Uh, the next thing that I need to do is I need to put something in the GPS here. We're going to have to do a little bit of a cheat here. Uh, the GNS 530 has a, a funny uh, kind of quirk to it that uh, it does not display DME for localizers, for ILS localizers, or for standalone localizers, or LDAs for that matter. So to get distance information from uh, that type of a source, we need to enter it uh, in the GPS. And we do need that DME information uh, to tell us where our fixes is, where our final approach fix is, where our missed approach point is, where ELMI is, those sorts of things. Uh, so what I can do to cheat, uh, since it won't display that when we have a localizer tuned in here, is I'll load the localizer ID into the GPS. So we'll hit direct, I'll hit the keyboard here, and then the identifier is India Foxtrot Yankee Victor. You can see it says that's the ILS to runway 6. It's not an, actually an ILS, but that's okay. It is the localizer to runway 16. I'll go ahead and activate. And then if I scroll with the GNS uh, 430 down here to the first page, you'll see down here in the middle block, uh, it gives me the distance from the localizer. So currently we're about uh, 22.9 nautical miles. And this will be close enough uh, to the DME readout that it will be accurate for shooting the approach. On this top GPS here, I'm just going to go ahead and fl uh, uh, flip this over to uh, nav page 3, which doesn't really give us any, any information, but we don't want the map up there. We want to fly this on rad raw data. Uh, so that's the way we get rid of that information. And then uh, page 1 here is not going to give you a map. It just gives you your distance information and your bearing and track uh, to that transmitter over there, which is not really helpful for flying the approach. I've got the autopilot set up. I've got 3,000 feet dialed in here, which is our top altitude and our initial altitude. Uh, so that's ready to go. I'll put the transponder in standby. And uh, that sets up everything that we need for the approach. So now it's time to go ahead and call and get our IFR clearance down to Drake Field. So Rogers does have a control tower. It is a controlled field, and they do have a clearance delivery frequency, so that's how we would get the clearance in real life. So we would call them up and say Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel looking for IFR down to Fayetteville Drake Field. They would call back and say Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel. Roger, you're cleared to Fayetteville Drake Field via the Rogers 4 departure. Then as filed, climb and maintain 3000, or they may tell us to climb via the SID. Uh, and they would give us a departure frequency and a squat code. So we'll say the squat code is 5502. We would read all that back to them, and then they would likely say uh, Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel, Roger, uh, call ground for taxi. So we'll go ahead and get our uh, comm radio set up, and then we'll call for taxi, and then taxi out, do a run-up, and then call tower for departure. So we'll taxi out and do our run-up, and once we're short of the runway, we'll call the tower for our takeoff clearance. They don't need to give us any specific takeoff instructions since we've already been cleared via the Rogers for departure. They'll just tell us cleared for takeoff, runway 20. We'll perform a normal takeoff from runway 20. At 400 feet AGL, we'll turn to that 183 heading specified by the departure procedure. Okay, so climbing through about a thousand feet above the field here, uh, we get handed off to Razorback Approach, and they say Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel uh, radar contact, climb maintain 3000, proceed direct to Razorback VOR. Looks like we're centered up on Razorback VOR. I do have the uh, autopilot on, vertical speed mode hold, and heading hold mode. I'll go ahead and flip it into nav mode, and we will go ahead and track out to uh, the Razorback VOR and climb to maintain uh, 3,000 feet and then do our cruise checklist once we level off there at 3,000 feet. 
All right, so it's leveling at 3,000. We'll go ahead and let it accelerate to about 105 knots indicated. And then once we get there, we'll go ahead and set the cruise power. We're in a quick cruise checklist. I'm not going to lean out the mixture just because we're below, you know, at or below 3,000. So we don't really need to do that. And then we'll just track to the VOR. And then once we cross the VOR, uh, then we will uh, start to track that 221 degree radial uh, down towards Elmi intersection. We'll assume that Razorback uh, Approach calls us back up and they say Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel, you're three miles from the Razorback Vortac. Uh, maintain 3000 until established on the approach. You are cleared for the localizer runway 16 into Fayetteville. And so now with that approach clearance, it gives us the uh, clearance to track all of those uh, uh, segments of the approach and to use those procedure altitudes once we're established on the approach. All right, so we're getting close to the VOR. We're looking for that uh, two flag to flip to front flag. And we do that, we're gonna go ahead and use heading mode uh, to turn it back out to that 221 heading and then intercept and track that radial. And again, I've already got that bottom radio set up to track that and then once we cross over the VOR I'll set up the top radio for that as well. 0.1 nautical miles there's the flip I'm going to go ahead and go into heading mode roll it over to a heading of about 221 and then we'll see where we need to go from there to intercept the radial. I'm going to go ahead and set this up for the 221 uh, course as well and then I can actually use one of these uh, to see how far off I am uh, to see how much more correction I need to have to get on the radial there. And then we also have the radial over down here in the uh, GNS 530. Uh, so let's see here, it looks like we're a little bit to the left of course. I'm gonna put about uh, 10 or 15 degree correction. I don't wanna do too much because I'm still relatively close to the station, only about a mile away from the station. Uh, see if we can get that back in there. It looks like 214, it's starting to come alive now. I'll go ahead and roll back towards uh, 225 or so. And then it, as it gets centered up, I can go ahead and go back to nav to make sure it gets nice and centered up on that uh, radial there. Looks like I rolled out a little early there. Put a little more correction. Now it's starting to come back in. Could go ahead and hit nav, get it nice and established on that outbound radial and then we'll put it back into heading mode and flip this over to the localizer so that when we get over to uh, LME intersection uh, we'll be ready to intercept that localizer. So I'm going to adjust my heading here not doing anything because I'm not in heading mode just so I have an idea what heading is tracking that radial. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this in Razorback VOR until I get to about 5.2 nautical miles because that's about uh, a mile from our localizer intercept and then I'll go ahead and flip it over uh, I'll take it you know out of the VOR tracking mode put the localizer in here so I can see that for the intercept and then just track this bottom radial with the heading mode okay so one, one mile away from Elmi I'm gonna go ahead and flip the localizer in here I'm going to dial in that 167 course. Again, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to do anything to the nav aid, but it gives me a reminder what that course is. Course is coming alive. I'm going to put it in heading mode, and then I'm going to roll over to that 167 heading to fly the localizer. And then once it's engaged, uh, I will go ahead and uh, engage uh, nav mode again. Looks like it's starting to center up there, so I will go ahead and engage nav mode, and now it is in active nav mode we are tracking the localizer inbound. So the autopilot's gonna take care of tracking that localizer for me. I'll go ahead and roll my heading bug over to about 167 or whatever is keeping that course there. And my distance from the VOR is 10.5, so I can go ahead and descend down to uh, 2,500 feet. So I'll put in 2,500 feet. I'll put it into a vertical speed hold mode of uh, about 500 feet per minute to get it on down there. And then once we get down there, we should be at about 8 DME from uh, the uh, localizer, which is 3 miles from our final approach fix. And we'll go ahead and start to configure for the approach from there. 
All right, so I'm leveling at uh, 2,500 feet. We've gone into an altitude hold mode. I'm going to go ahead and reset my uh, altitude pre-select here uh, to 1,900 feet, which is above our DDA of uh, 1,830. Always want to set that just a little bit higher, so I'll be ready to initiate the descent here. So I'm going to pause here for just a second and talk about what altitude to enter into the altitude selector for the final approach segment. You'll notice that I said to set it at 1900 feet, but then I actually set it to 1800 feet. And actually either technique is valid. If you set it to 1800, which is your MDA rounded up to the next 100 foot increment, you're setting it lower than the DDA, but higher than your MDA. So that is still technically legal. If you do this, you'll have the advantage of your autopilot not attempting to level above the DDA, so you don't have to disconnect the autopilot until you get down to 1830. You just need to remember to execute the missed approach if you get to your DDA and you don't see anything. You can also set it to 1900 feet, which is the DDA rounded up to the next 100 foot increment. This is also a valid technique that's used by many pilots and flight departments. They will tell you never to set anything in your altitude selector that's lower than what you intend to fly. But you need to be aware that if you do it this way, the autopilot will attempt to level at 1900 feet when it gets there. So you'll either be missing the approach quite early or you'll have to disconnect the autopilot uh, and manually fly it down to 18, 1830 feet. Again, either technique is valid. It's just a matter of personal preference and or chief pilot preference as to which technique you use. Back to the approach. There's eight miles, so I'm gonna go ahead and start configuring for the approach. So I'll bring the uh, power back to about 1800 RPMs. We're already below 110, so I can stick that first notch of flaps out. Once I get below 85, we'll go ahead and incrementally stick out the rest of those flaps. There's the second notch, and there's the third notch. And then at about 75 knots, I'll go ahead and lead the power, bring it up to about 23 to 2400 RPMs to hold that 70 knots. So all we want to do now is track the localizer. We're waiting for 5.0 uh, DME off the localizer uh, to tell us that we can start our descent uh, down, and then we'll uh, use that 400 foot per minute descent. Uh, to track down the localizer and track down that uh, visual descent path, adjusting our power to stay on speed and uh, cross-checking with those descent cross checkpoints to make sure that our descent is accurate. All right, so we're coming up on 5 DME. So we hit 5 DME. I'll go ahead and put it in a vertical speed hold mode to 400 feet per minute. I'm going to reduce that power so that we stay at uh, 70 knots. Should be about 1,800 to 2,000 RPM. So I'll start out about 1,900 feet. And the next thing I'm looking for is 4.2. When I get to 4.2 DME, I should be at about uh 2250 on the altimeter so we'll see how that's working out as far as if we are on our uh, glide path so there comes 4.2 dme i'm just a little bit high just maybe 20 feet high that's pretty darn close so i'm happy with that i'm going to keep that descent rate in there but again if i's high i would want to increase my descent rate to get down a little bit quicker uh, if I was low, then I would want to decrease that descent rate. Now I'm looking for 3.2 and looking for about 1940 on the altimeter. And again, 1830 is the point at which I want to look up and see if I can uh, see the approach lights at that point. So looking for 3.2 DME. There's 3.4 coming through 2000 feet. So it's looking pretty good. There's 3.2, I should be at 1940, I'm at 1960, so that's pretty darn close. I'm going to go ahead and kick off that autopilot about uh, 1850 before it starts to make the level off. And I'll take a look up, and we have the approach light, so we can come down to 100 feet above our touchdown zone elevation. 
And I'm getting the runway end identifier lights in sight and the Pappy as well. So I am good to descend all the way to a landing. Looks like I've got red over white. And uh, so I'm on glide path, got a good visual on the runway. We'll just proceed to a visual landing from here. So that is how you fly a localizer approach uh, using the 172 Classic. So the standards that you need to meet in order to consider yourself proficient at this type of approach are listed in the Airman Certification Standards for the Instrument Rating. It's Area of Operation 6, Instrument Approaches, Task A, Non-Precision Approaches. Prior to the final approach fix, it looks very much like the ILS standards. You need to maintain your altitude plus or minus 100 feet, maintain your heading plus or minus 10 degrees, and maintain your airspeed plus or minus 10 knots, and accurately track radials, courses, and bearings. Generally, that's considered less than a full-scale deflection on radials and courses, and less than 10 degrees of deflection on an NDB bearing or anything that you're using a uh, bearing pointer for. Once you get to the final approach fix, and I have kind of massaged this language for using the CDFA technique and eliminated the stuff that talks about the dive or drive type method, uh, you need to be able to maintain a stabilized approach, no excessive descent rates or excessive speeds, uh, allow no more than a three-quarters scale deflection of your lateral course guidance or your CDI. If you get out to three-quarters uh, scale deflection, you need to execute your missed approach. Uh, maintain your airspeed on that descent, plus or minus 10 knots, and then immediately initiate your missed approach procedure at your DDA, or if you have the runway environment in sight, transition to a visual approach using a normal rate of descent and normal maneuvering. The full list of standards that you need to be aware of when shooting this approach in real life, again, are available in the Airman Certification Standards for the Instrument Approach. Again, it is uh, Area of Operation 6, Task A, and you can pause the screen and look at it here, or you can go to the FAA's website and download that document and find it in that section. You'll notice there's a lot of language in here that I didn't include that talks about risk management and judgment and those sorts of things. And then the language in this document is, is tailored uh, towards either type of approach, shooting either a CDFA technique or the old dive and drive technique. So the language is in here to allow for both of those techniques to be flown. That concludes this video. Hopefully it's given you the skills, knowledge, and confidence you need to try out localizer approaches using analog flight instrumentation. As always, if you've enjoyed the content, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and ring the notification bell to be alerted to new content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.